Okay, so this week I want to talk about we're talking about nickel super alloys. This is the last sort of major thing that we need to that we need to hit, <clears throat> and it's a really fun topic. Um, I think no um, in in recent time no material has had a as dramatic an effect on humanity as the development of nickel superalloys. Right? If we think about how cheap air travel is today, right? This is nothing new to you guys, right? And you've always lived in a world where you could hop on an airplane. Um, but I remember when I was a kid, it was like a big deal that we took a plane ride, right? That we went, um, instead of driving 14 hours from Chicago to Buffalo, we flew once, right? Um, because air travel, even in the early 1980s, was very expensive, right? I think... The absolute cost, like the absolute dollar amount for a flight to Europe has gone down dramatically since the 19, late 1970s. And if you think and you take inflation into account, right, you know, I just bought plane tickets to Germany for $600 round trip, right? In 1975, that would have been like... $800 real, and considering that minimum wage back then was $2.15 an hour, right? A plane trip to Europe was a huge deal. Um, so, you know, to the point was that when I was a kid, Greyhound buses were still a thing, right? Because people would rather spend two days on a bus going across the country than pay the exorbitant cost for, for a plane ticket, right? Nowadays, spring break in Europe, not a big deal, right? <clears throat> and it is all due to the development of nickel super alloys. For titanium, we talked about all the parts that were made of titanium, the low, the compressor, the fan, the shrouds, nickel, all the hot parts, the high pressure turbine, the low pressure turbine, all right? And if we look at the development here in 1970, right, the T41, the first stage turbine, right? So remember, jet engine works. Right, very simple, very simple thermodynamic process of suck, squeeze, blow. Right at the hot stage turbine, if we look at the temperatures of a jet engine in 1970, 1345C, today's engines are running approximately 300 degrees higher for commercial engines, military engines, they're actually running. Uh, at temperatures that exceed the melting temperature of the nickel alloys that are in there, right? Because they have um, active cooling and thermal barrier uh, coatings in there, so the metal itself isn't that hot. But the temperature of the of the the turbine in, turbine inlet temperature right after the combustor is actually above the melting temperature of the materials that are in that engine, right? So commercial engines are not prime reliant on coatings to keep the blade, the engine from melting. Military engines are. So if something happens to the coatings of the military engine, the inside just melts, right? And the components are cast, right? This is a, a single crystal of nickel, 
All right, this C, the solidification direction is the cube direction, right? And these are cast with crazy intricate cooling geometries, right? Then they have cooling passages, and then there's laser drilling, right? And so the development of this single crystal technology, the alloy and the processing technology, has been a huge enabler. Right, and the two things that the the two major design criteria are, of course, creep. Right, we're spinning something around at very high RPM, um, at very high homologous temperatures, like 0.9 of its melting temperature. Right, and we're essentially doing the equivalent of uh, hanging a school bus from one of these blades. Right, if you calculate the the aerodynamic loading that it's experiencing. So statically, it's equivalent of heating this up to 90% of its melting temperature and then hanging a very large hunk of metal from it. All right. So creep is a huge design criteria. And then fatigue, right? Because we have many thermal cycles, right? So we have low cycle fatigue every time the engine shuts up and starts down. Then we have high high cycle fatigue from vibration uh, as this thing's spinning. So I talked about how super alloys have sort of redefined our world a little bit, but what, what are they? It's kind of a loose definition, right? So we'll say it's a metallic alloy that can be used at very high temperatures, right? Often, uh, at temperatures that are in excess of 0.7 of its absolute melting temperature. All right, creep, and of course, oxidation resistance, right? Doesn't do us much good if right, you're, in a, you're in a combustion environment, right? So you're direct exposure to flame. So you don't want it to, uh, to oxidize away. And there are super alloy compositions based on iron, cobalt, and nickel. We're going to focus just on nickel because that is by far the most common, uh, commonly used for, for aero engines. Yeah. For not everywhere we use single crystal. The blades are single crystal. The discs are polycrystal. Um, Right, because you don't, if you cast a disc out of a big single crystal, now you have anisotropy, right? Right. Um, the blades are single crystal for the most part. Right. So the super alloys are all based on essentially the nickel aluminum phase diagram. Right, and nickel is of course pure nickel is single phase FCC. Right, nickel three <coughs> aluminum is what we call the gamma prime phase, and this is a ordered structure that will show based on the FCC uh, cell. And if we're in between, we're in the gamma plus gamma prime phase. Right, and this is the two phase region where uh, we want to be for, uh, for super alloys. The other critical alloying element is titanium. Right? And typically we have concentration that's less than 10 atomic percent. This is, of course, in uh, um, weight percent. Right, so we're always we're generally going to be in this two phase gamma gamma prime structure, and it's the gamma prime phase which is going to be responsible for this the elevated temperature uh, strength and this the incredible resistance to creep. So what is the gamma prime phase? It's nickel three aluminum, right? And you'll see it looks like an FCC unit cell, except we have 
aluminum on the corner and nickel on the face. But remember a crystal, if, if these were random, it would be FCC. But since it's ordered, it is actually a primitive cubic unit cell. Right? This is a question I like to ask in candidacy exams, especially for metal people. And you'd be surprised the number of people that get it wrong when I say, what's the crystal structure for the L12? It's particularly embarrassing for one of Professor Mills' students to get this wrong. But remember, a crystal structure is a lattice and a motif. Right? In this case, the motif is a... Um, Aluminum with three nickels, right? And this is periodically repeated at every one of the corners, right? So it's a primitive cubic lattice with a four atom, uh, four atom motif, right? And if we look here, this is the nickel titanium aluminum ternary. I still hate reading these things, but you can still see here. Here's the gamma and the gamma prime phase, and this is the region that we're playing with for the two phase, for the two phase structure. All right? Okay. So our gamma phase forms the matrix. <coughs> gamma prime is the precipitate, All right? Both phases have a cubic lattice very similar lattice parameters. So we have a cube-cube orientation relationship with the gamma, right? So we have a coherent interface where the A, B, and C crystallographic axes are all, in the gamma and the gamma prime are all parallel with each other, right? So we have a coherent matrix. Okay. Dislocations in gamma are very difficult to... Um, enter into gamma prime. We'll talk a lot about this, but really you have ordering, right? So if you have a perfect FCC dislocation, right, it's going to be a partial in the um, gamma prime, and it's going to leave behind an antiphase boundary, right? So you're going to have, across that boundary, you're going to have mismatched neighbors. So it's a high energy configuration, right? Given the fact that the dislocations of the gamma, because of the stacking, the relatively low stacking fault energy, the partials in the gamma are relatively far separated. So when you have a partial that goes into the um, gamma prime, it leaves behind a complex, much more complicated stacking fault that we'll, that we'll look at. Right. And so we have a strong strengthening of the alloy a very low gamma gamma prime interfacial energy, right? Um, coarsening behavior is essentially just Oswald ripening, driven entirely by the minimization of the interfacial energy, right? Um, and this coherent uh, interface, right, makes the makes the microstructure relatively stable which is going to be uh, useful for our high um, uh, elevated temperature application, right? Okay. So the uh, mismatch between gamma and gamma prime can be tallered by, uh, by alloying, right? So we can play a trade-off between the amount of strengthening we get versus the stability of the microstructure, right? Because the more we uh, play with the coherency, we're going to affect how easy things are to cut, but we're also going to drastically change our interfacial energy and change our coarsening. Coarsening kinetics, right? Um, gamma prime is a, is is a really ordered structure, right? But it also is relatively ductile, right? So we, it does, it can, dislocations can move through it, it has a fairly low pyrostress, 
right? We don't have to worry about catastrophic embrittlement, right? which, is, which is really nice. And then also there's something odd about this. The strength increases with temperature up to about 700 C. We'll talk a lot about this. This is called anomalous strengthening of superalloys, right? Most materials, of course, get softer as you raise the temperature, right? But in, in superalloys, we get an increase in strength. Something makes the gamma prime more difficult to cut as you increase the temperature, which seems very counterintuitive because you increase the temperature, you have more thermal energy available for dislocation motion. What it does is it actually opens up other channels of um, motion that lead to making the dislocations more sessile, right? So you have more sessile dislocations as you go uh, as you go up in temperature. It's a it's a weird thing, and we'll talk about it in more in more detail. Right? One thing we do have to pay attention to for the same composition as we go up in temperature. The extent of the uh, two phase field decreases, and so the relative fraction of gamma prime tends to decrease as we go um, up in temperature. Right? This is handy from a processing point of view because we can dissolve the gamma prime. Um, uh, giving it a solution treatment to homogenize the composition and then give it a uh, aging at a lower temperature to try and generate a uniform fine dispersion of the gamma of the gamma prime but it also puts sort of an upper limit as to the operational temperature because we don't want to dissolve away our gamma prime um, uh, in service so General microstructure kind of looks like this. We have our large gamma grains. And then we have primary gamma prime grains. These are large grains on the order of 10 microns or so that are, um, oops, which we will then, uh, these remain after the solution solution heat treatment, right? In some conditions, we want them. Other times, we want to dissolve them completely away. Secondary gamma prime is going to form at high temperatures on cooling from the solution heat treatment. And these are tens of nanometers, tens to hundreds of nanometers, right? And then... The smallest precipitates are um, precipitate at lower temperatures on cooling from the solution treat treatment. And these are going to be tertiary gamma prime, and they're going to be on the order of 5 to 10, 5 to 10 nanometers, right? So it's a heterogeneous multi-scale distribution of, of strengthening, right? Typically, these will, will then go through an age treatment, and the tertiary gamma prime um, will grow to 15 to 50 nanometers, right? So a very fine scale, right? So if you think about what's happening here, this very fine, nearly homogeneous distribution, right? These act kind of like GP zones, right? This gives us kind of a general lattice friction, a general strengthening. Right. Then we have these larger, very, still very fine, 100 nanometer or so precipitates that are going to give us be our main obstacles, main pinning obstacles for dislocation, uh, for dislocation motion. Right. So a very complicated, uh, complicated system. So. Gamma prime, depending on where we are and where, where our, what our composition is and where we're cooling from, can either occur by a classical nucleation and growth mechanism or by a, uh, 
um, spinodal, right? So either nucleation and growth or local ordering and phase separation, right? Typically, the higher the alloy concentration, the more likely we are to form by a, a spinodal mechanism rather than, than nucleation and growth. Okay? So, if we look at our typical treatment, here we have um, sort of as cast, right, we've got these large gamma prime regions, very heterogeneous structure. The typical treatment is to go up, solution, solutionize, and to the, the gamma phase dissolve all the gamma field, dissolve all the gamma prime, cool down, right, and then have a aging treatment. And if we look at the structure after cooling, here we see our secondary gamma prime particles. Here's our tertiary gamma prime. And this is a disc alloy, which is characterized, disc alloys typically have very high gamma prime volume fractions, right, upwards of um, 80% gamma prime fraction, right? And so if you think about a dislocation in the gamma trying to move through this, this minefield of gamma prime particles, this boulder field essentially, right? You could see the sort of torturous path that it, that it has to lead. So the cooling rate from here to here is going to have a huge effect on the microstructure, as you can expect, right? So if we cool at a relatively fast cooling rate, 200 degrees Fahrenheit a minute, right? Again, comic sands, you can see I stole this slide from Jim Williams. All right. We see we have a... Um, fairly high secondary gamma prime fraction of 75%, right? The secondary gamma primes themselves are fairly small, and we have a small amount, about 3 to 4% of tertiary gamma prime in the structure. If we cool it slower, we have larger secondary gamma prime, a smaller fraction, and a larger amount of tertiary gamma prime that's going to form, okay? So gamma prime is not strictly stoichiometric phase, right? It's not perfect nickel-3 aluminum, right? We have, uh, there's going to be uh, vacancies on one of the, the sub-lattices, which can give us deviations from stoichiometry. Also, we do, the ordering is not always 100% perfect. There are mismatch, right? We do have nickel on the aluminum site and aluminum on the nickel site occasionally, right? Aluminum and titanium, niobium, hafnium, tantalum, other common alloy elements are going to preferentially uh, partition into the gamma prime, right? In which case they're going to mostly lie on the aluminum uh, sublattice, right? Gamma stabilizers, um, which we'll we'll talk about, uh, can partition, and they'll if they're in gamma prime, they'll be on the nickel sublattice, but most of the time they'll be uh, partitioned. Into the gamma, into the gamma phase. Okay, so gamma prime is not the only strengthening phase possible. There's also the gamma double prime phase, right? So typically, gamma double prime strengthening is used um, for lower temperature 
super alloys, sometimes for turbine disc applications, right? Um, this is, uh, instead of nickel-3 aluminum, this is the nickel-3 niobium or nickel-3 vanadium uh, structure. Significant uh, super alloys with a lot of niobium are the Inconel family. Inconel 718 is probably the most common. Um, that uh, that people people know of, right? And the gamma double prime is a body center tetragonal lattice with an ordered arrangement of nickel, um, nickel and uh, niobium, right? So because this is not cubic, right? We're going to have uh, a large degree of incoherency. Right? So we have coherency hardening and order hardening mechanisms for uh, the gamma prime, gamma double prime, gamma double prime phase. Right? And of course, we also have other uh, phases that can form. Right? There's a large group of... Um, generally undesirable phases called topologically close packed phases. And these are brittle, brittle intermetallic like phases, right? So the name is a little confusing. So the unit cells of these, we have close layers of close packed atoms separated by um, uh, larger, larger atoms sandwiched in between, right? So the, the name that these have been given is, is topologically close packed. So like close packed layer with um, other atoms in there, so the planes are, uh, the close packed planes are not separated by their sort of usual, usual distance. Right, we have sigma phase, mu phase, which is the B7A6, Lave's phases, right? A lot of times these form as plates or needles in a single plane. And this plate-like structure is generally bad for mechanical properties because of uh, ductility um, and uh, easy crack, easy crack formation. Sigma is one of the worst, right? Uh, we could see here sigma phase forming on uh, grain boundaries, right? So anytime you have grain boundaries that are nearly continuously covered with um, uh, brittle phases, right? You got a nice, nice short circuit crack path, right? Plus, they are typically much higher in alloying element, so they suck the good. Uh, gamma and gamma prime strengthening elements in a non-useful strengthening form. So we we reduce our creep strength. Creep strength as well. So the interesting thing about these TCP phases is that in early generation super alloys, these were not a concern. As we get to more and more complex alloying, more complicated um, systems, especially when we start to add significant amounts of rare earth elements, these become are, are now a real significant problem for current generation alloys where they were not a problem before. Right? New um, New super alloys are, uh, we'll see some of the comp compositions. These are 12, potentially 14 element alloy soups, right? Super complicated, super um, optimized structure. And at, for current generation single crystal alloys, the uh, 
formation of these TCPs are generally slow, but the service life, surface life of components are getting longer and longer and longer, right? So we're at a design range where TCP formation can potentially become a life-limiting um, uh, structure, right? So here we see these... Um, TCP phases are typically sometimes coded in a um, a layer of thin layer of gamma prime in a, a gamma a gamma matrix, right? Okay. So for how are we doing, Thomas? Okay, good. So for uh, super alloy microstructures, we have to think about a couple different aspects when trying to think about describing the grain, the structure. So we have in the gamma phase itself, we have solid solution strengthening, right? We want alloying that is going to um, uh, we're trying to maximize strength here, right? So if we're going to create a lot of gamma prime, right, we don't want to leave just weak, very weak matrix behind, right? We don't want these difficult to cut particles in a phase where we can have lots of easy plastic deformation. So we want to maximize solid solution strengthening in the gamma phase, okay? We need to control grain size, right? right? Why is grain size something that we really need to consider? How does grain size play into high temperature creep life? Smaller grain worse. Smaller grains are worse for creep, right? So in the limit of the blades, you go to a single crystal, right? No grain boundary area, right? You got essentially infinite grain size, right? It's going to be best for creep, right? But we also have a trade-off with fatigue, right? Where large grains are, are going to be worse for fatigue. So we have to think carefully about the grain size for the particular application where, where in the engine something is going to be. Right, and then the nature of the precipitates, right? Whether it's a gamma prime strength in alloy, a gamma double prime, or there are some alloys that actually have use make use of gamma and gamma prime, gamma and gamma double prime. Gamma, say it right, gamma prime and gamma double prime simultaneously, right? And then grain boundaries, chemistry, and morphology. Morphology is really important for creep strength. Chemistry is to what are we going to segregate to grain boundaries that are going to affect our properties and processing. Right? So, grain size, we can see as we make the grain size, our creep life goes up, but our low cycle fatigue life plummets. Right? So, this. And as our grain size gets larger, our crack growth rate goes up and our tensile strength decreases a little bit. So our tensile strength isn't going to be a huge criterion with, with, with grain size. But this trade-off between creep life and low cycle fatigue life is going to be critical in thinking about how we design and and process these, right? So it's a, a balance and a compromise of properties. Okay. So I like this chart a lot. This is probably the simplest, most straightforward uh, thing I've seen for how to think about the alloying elements in, in super alloys. So we have our 
gamma prime formers in pink, aluminum, titanium, niobium, hafnium, and tantalum, right, are gamma strengtheners, vanadium, chrome, iron, cobalt, nickel, molybdenum, tungsten, rhenium, right, these are going to go into the gamma matrix and provide solid solution strengthening, and then we have essentially grain boundary strengtheners, right? Often through the formation of carbides, right? Notice zirconium here really could be colored halfway, right? Titanium and hafnium and zirconium are both group four hexagonal metals, right? So. It just zirconium happens to be a, very, um, a more potent carbide former than titanium or titanium or, or uh, or no, I'm saying that backwards. Um, zirconium is going to segregate faster to the grain boundaries than either titanium or hafnium, and the role of Titanium and half or more uh, are going to be more um, potent carbide formers. I have it spelled out in words here on this 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 slide. Right. So if we could segregate our boron zirconium to the grain boundaries, right? We lower our grain boundary energy. Right. We have better creep strength and ductility. When we're going to have potential failure mechanisms that involve grain decohesion, right? Zirconium does form oxide. Generally, you you yeah, it, it's it's a mess. There's a lot of mechanisms going on here. Right? These are kind of first order. Great, yeah. So, again, this is kind of first first approximation. Um, uh, alloying rules. But no, zirconium will form, um, will form, uh, definitely will, is a strong oxide former. What's that? Bonding former or oxide? Well, it does. Zirconium is easily oxidized, right? So it will form oxi uh, oxides. It is not as potent a carbide former as titanium. Right, let's make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, yeah. Zirconium is strong enough that it, at high temperatures it will rip, uh, split water. All right, it'll pull uh, oxygen and give you hydrogen gas. All right, so that's a um, uh, easily oxidized. All right, so we've got a whole range of carbide formers. All right, these carbides are going to precipitate at grain boundaries and give us a tortuous or serpentine-like grain boundary structure. That's going to reduce the tendency for grain boundary sliding at high temperatures. So take away a, a creep mechanism. And then we have a whole mess of solid solution strengtheners in the gamma or the gamma prime, depending on um, where, they, where they end up. Okay. So I wish I had a reference for this uh, image, because it's it's um, really useful, and it was it was one of the few bits I took from Professor Fraser's notes on that I that I kept from when he taught this. Right, 
but it shows a lot of what's on the uh, a lot of the the issues with thinking about um, alloying here, right? So mol molybdenum, chromium, cobalt, iron, rhenium, ruthenium, right? These are going into the gamma, right? Our composition strongly influences misfit. Tungsten can either partition into gamma or gamma prime, depending on what other elements are there, right? We have our gamma prime formers, aluminum, titanium, niobium, tantalum, vanadium, right? Our refractory are going to form secondary carbides like the M23C6 or M6C type carbon, uh, carbides. Titanium, zirconium, and niobium can form MC-type carbides, right? Boron, zirconium, grain boundary strengtheners, right? And then we have uh, um, oxide formers, right? We need to also consider the high temperature oxidation of our components. Right, so these are just some of the criteria that we need to think about with this this alloy soup, right? And it becomes really complicated if you if you talk to like Professor Mills students who are looking at the microstructures of these. They have lots of things that are they they can recognize that they're carbides from chemistry and do EDS and say, oh, these are carbides, but. They don't know what carbides they are, right? They don't know whether they're these M23C6 or MC carbides, right? So even in alloys that are well studied and in use, it's not always clear what microstructure, what what components are actually there, even when you're characterizing them. So these things become... Uh, um, very complicated, right? So these are, I would say, older generation. Uh, Rene eighty eight, right? These are second, I'd say, second generation. Um, still in service, but if you look at the the alloying here. Right, we've got nickel and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, potentially ten alloying elements. Right, and these don't even include some of the minor ones like the rare earths and others. Right, so the compositions are become quite complicated. Right, the main difference between uh, rotors and airfoils is airfoils need to be single crystal, right? They're going to have a smaller fraction of uh, cobalt and chrome, a higher percentage of uh, tungsten and aluminum, right? We're going to increase our gamma prime uh, forming elements, right? to try and get our gamma prime fractions as, as high as as uh, as high as possible. Right? There's also another disconcerting trend is that as we improve our compositions, they tend to get heavier because we're adding more and more heavy rare earth and refractory elements to them, right? So we're we're going the opposite trend than we really want to go. Right? We really want to go um, to lighter, right? Because we have to fly this thing, right? But the higher temperatures that you can go to offset the fuel savings from that are markedly uh, offset by the higher fraction, the higher uh, the higher weight, right? So thermodynamically, if we can increase the operating temperature. We get a lot more bang from our buck than we can by reducing the weight of the these engine engine components. 
right? And so if you look, this is just a composition of the compositions of a whole bunch of uh, uh, alloys out there. These are just really for your for reference, right? Single crystal is cast for blade alloys. Wrought is cast, cast and wrought. PM stands for uh, powder metallurgy, right? We'll talk about it. Right, so anything that says wrought or PM is going to be uh, um, a um, disc alloy, right? And so you can see, uh, you know, some compositions, you know, yttria, ruthenium, kind of weird things that are, that are in there. Right. And so we will stop there. And then on Wednesday, we'll hit sort of specific microstructure features and, and strengthening.